When child sexual abuse cases are reported, the main focus is usually on the graphic physical details. We hear numbered accounts of rape and molestation, crimes themselves which usually occur in minutes, yet are pulled from stories that in fact span years and whose impacts last a lifetime. Confronting visual descriptions make for the biggest headlines, yet they only capture the smallest component of assault. In reality, most of child sexual abuse is invisible. It's immeasurable and untraceable. It is therefore simultaneously the hardest thing for a child to explain, let alone prove, and the easiest thing for a perpetrator to deny. Most child sexual abuse takes the form of premeditated torture, sinister psychological manipulation. And although it is arguably the utmost of evils, it is this part of the crime that is the most difficult to criminalise. What I'm referring to is grooming, the insidious process by which predators prepare us for and eventually forcibly condition us to accept abuse without even realising it. Grooming is one of the most common practices across the globe. Why is it then that we rarely hear about it in mainstream media or our everyday conversations? Changing that is my mission. It is my mission to bring the backdrop of child sexual abuse to the forefront of our collective conscience. Grooming has never been the focus of a social revolution until now. Grooming is not just a weapon of psychological control exclusive to predators who prey on innocent children. It can be used by power holders anytime, in any environment. And it is the world over. Elements of grooming mirror the coercion that underpins domestic violence and workplace bullying, as well as our political structures. Those who abuse power don't want us to understand grooming because it is a cornerstone of all corruption from the bottom to the very top of society. I reported my experience of child sexual abuse and grooming to police when I was only 16, after it began approximately a year earlier. This was both a good thing and a bad thing. It was good in that it was almost immediately after it happened so the pursuit of justice began as soon as possible. It was bad because I was still so young and therefore unaware of the depths of the psychological rewiring that had been deliberately forged by a predator in my still developing brain. I didn't understand what had happened to me even as I was going through it. It wasn't until several years after the fact that I actually thought to look up what the term grooming meant. It was equal parts validating and confronting. Finally, I could put a name to all of the inexplicable things I'd seen and felt. But at the same time, I realized how much I had protected the perpetrator because of my inability to articulate all the layers of his criminal behavior when I made my statement as a child. Despite its complexity, grooming can be simplified into six core concurrent phases. These phases are attributed to a 2016 academic paper by Georgia Winters and Elizabeth Jeglick. Over the years, I've personally adapted them as a way of processing my trauma. The following are the six stages of grooming, which together paint a picture of how predators drive abuse. The first phase is targeting, that is, identifying a vulnerable individual. It goes without saying that children are the easiest targets. By definition, all children and adolescents are vulnerable. It is now an extensively scientifically evidenced fact that the human brain is not fully developed until at least age 24. And one of the slowest developing regions of the brain is the prefrontal cortex, responsible for impulse control and judgment. I was only 15 when I was targeted by a 58-year-old serial pedophile who taught at my high school. 
but my age was not the only factor in my vulnerability. I had also been battling anorexia for several years. When I was 14, I was hospitalized for six weeks. I was bedridden and tube fed. The school staff knew that I was ill. After I was discharged from hospital for the first time, a condition of my outpatient program was that all my meals had to be supervised by teachers on school days. On top of all this, I came from a broken home. My parents were divorced when I was only two. And although I have never doubted that they both love me endlessly, growing up, I struggled to properly attach to either of them. Until my mid-teens, I rarely spent more than a week at a time in one house. Every three to four days, I had to pack my things in a bag and uproot. I had no stability, no base. My internal insecurity was reflected externally. As soon as my outpatient program ended, I relapsed with anorexia and was hospitalized a second time when I was 15. The circumstances were ripe for abuse. I craved attachment. I craved undivided attention. I craved a friend. Once the pedophile had learned all of these things about me after what I mistook as a series of harmless conversations, moving to the next phase of grooming was easy for him. The next phase of grooming is gaining trust. By presenting as a friend, by feigning concern, and by offering help, predators are able to lull their targets into a false sense of security. It was during my experience of this phase that the pedophile opened up to me to make me feel like I was able to do the same, to make me feel special. He shared details about his private life and asked questions about mine. And I answered them just as I would have any other person in a position of authority with a supposed duty of care. He soon discovered something else about me, which guaranteed to him that I was a prime target. When I was six years old, I was abused by an older child who asked me to undress in a closet before molesting me. Mistreatment was familiar to me. I would be easy to trigger and harder to shock. Some of the work, some of the grooming had already been done. I've since learned that this is what abusers do. They pick up where previous abusers have left off. This is not only to trigger targets, but to ensure against them speaking out because doing so would mean throwing others under the bus too. In the third phase of grooming, the pedophile well and truly cemented himself by filling a need. This phase requires an especially high level of calculation. It involves identifying a specific gap in the target's emotional support network and then playing the role that fills that gap. In my case, although I was surrounded by an attentive network of family and medical health professionals, Theirs was a tough love approach. The pedophile therefore assumed the role of sympathizer, telling me everything he thought I wanted to hear. He then set about isolating, which makes up the fourth phase of grooming. It refers to the ways in which perpetrators drive wedges between the target and all of their genuine supporters. After they've forged an attachment, Perpetrators begin slowly dissolving their target's true support networks by discrediting, mocking, and discouraging contact with others. For instance, my abuser degraded my mother who was pregnant at the time. He said she was full of hormones. He also ridiculed staff and fellow students and undermined my perception of my father. I remember the feeling of loneliness distinctly. I became untethered to both my loved ones and my sense of self. Once these key relationships have been successfully compromised, the attachment between an abuser and their target is strengthened. And this protects the abuser against a target's ability to escape from anything, especially the sexualizing, which is the fifth phase. By gradually exposing children to explicit material, pedophiles normalize sex 
so that when physical abuse is actually initiated, it's less shocking. This adds to the self-doubt of targets as well, who upon reflection begin to wonder whether it was there all along and thus their responsibility to stop it from happening. As the target, you beat yourself up for missing things. In my case, the pedophile encouraged me to watch films that glorified relationships between characters with significant age differences. One of them ended on the line, give me a girl at an impressionable age and she's mine for life. What's more, the way in which the pedophile initiated sexual contact with me was by recreating my traumatic childhood experience of molestation by instructing me to undress in a closet beforehand. It was my fault, I thought to myself in that moment. I gave him the idea by telling him about my past. The sixth phase of grooming is the last, but most defining. It is maintaining control. Perpetrators do this by striking a perfect balance between causing pain and providing relief from that pain. They're at once the villain and the savior, the poison and the antidote. Hence why children find it nearly impossible to explain or escape from, let alone prove the psychological harm they cause. Abusers threaten and degrade, then soothe and praise, thereby gaslighting you into cyclical cognitive dissonance. This is what they're masters of, driving you into a state of total confusion that leaves you feeling helpless, hopeless, ashamed, unable to escape, and virtually insane. Just as you can't bear to be with them, you can't bear to be without them. The first time he showed himself naked to me, my abuser said, I'll lose my job if anyone hears about this. After raping me on the floor one day, I asked him if he thought I was fat. He told me I could do with some more exercise. He weaponized my eating disorder to crush my self-esteem. But he also told me I was beautiful sometimes when it was convenient. Ultimately, perpetrators destroy your identity and replace it with one that is completely controlled by them. As you can now see, each of these intersecting elements of grooming combine to form a powerful mechanism used by perpetrators to entrap you physically and mentally in their world. By reducing child sexual abuse to single acts of violence, we shield this system from view and we protect perpetrators. This is the very reason child sexual abuse has been able to continue for so long unchecked. We need to make understanding grooming a societal priority. As a start, we have to listen. Every single survivor has value. Every single survivor has unique insights that can inform and inspire change. Indeed, everyone's experience of grooming looks different, both internally and externally. That said, the fears, the shame, the self-destruction are all largely the same. You lose trust in others and in your own judgment equally. You lose yourself in a turbulent sea of self-doubt. I've only ever seen grooming from the inside. I don't know what it looks like from the perspective of a parent or a bystander. And even if I did, one thing I know for sure is that while it's happening, it doesn't make logical sense to anyone except the perpetrator. Also, it's important to note that perpetrators don't just groom their targets, they groom everyone to create an environment in which abuse can thrive in plain sight. It's an entire system, an ecosystem of control of which physical acts make up just one part. What's more, practiced perpetrators know that after a while, after the effects of grooming start to take hold, children will invariably start behaving in ways that to outsiders does very much make it appear as if they don't want to leave the abusive situation. Stockholm Syndrome. When everything else is taken away from you and you are forced to depend on a perpetrator, abuse becomes a part of your identity. Even though this isn't a conscious choice, it's inevitable. You can't help it. Your behavior changes accordingly. You adapt to abuse. You develop a desperation to get the most painful parts 
over and done with as soon as possible. Eventually, you find yourself initiating physical contact. You watch yourself walk up to the person who is hurting you and give them a hug. You hear yourself saying, I love you. This is how you cope. It's like being possessed. You watch everything play out and then go home and cry yourself to sleep. You cut yourself and drink until you pass out. It's like sleep paralysis. It's like you're awake, but you can't move your body the way you want to. You dress to impress them. You become their fantasy. You feel compelled to be with them and paranoid when they aren't there. Why? Because what's scarier than seeing that you are sharing the room with a spider on the wall? Sharing a room with a spider, but not knowing where it is. This paranoia and hypervigilance stay with you long after the physical abuse stops. Elements of grooming are internalized in all of us. So how do we undo it? How do we rewire our brains and reconnect with reality? Right before I spoke to the police, I experienced a propulsive surge of rage. The rage was so overwhelming that it actually surpassed my fear and transformed into courage, which was what was needed to take the first step towards justice. One of the forces that drove that rage was the knowledge that my abuser had at least one other victim. He once boasted about her to me while he was abusing me. The thought of all the harm he'd caused to people just within my knowledge, let alone outside of it, made me furious. The thought of my own inaction and silence potentially enabling further abuse became more repulsive and harder to live with than my memories. And so in the same strange way that rage became my courage, fear had become my conviction. Two dark forces became positive ones and together they combined to form the ultimate guiding light, hope. So that's how I did it. That's how I broke the cycle of abuse and grooming. I leant into the anger and fear and found courage, conviction, and finally hope within them. I leant into my truth and realized it was my power, its good and its bad parts. When they investigated him, the police found 28 multimedia files of child abuse material on this pedophile's home computer. They also found a trophy file of other students he'd collected over the years, some in their school uniform, others topless. I have since been contacted by some of his other survivors, some of whose experiences of abuse the school already knew about before I was even born. There were staff who tried to blow the whistle, but those with the power to stop him ultimately chose to protect the institution. It's my belief that they were groomed to do so. All of this is painfully true, but what's also true is that things are changing for the better. Survivors everywhere are being empowered to tell their stories, to educate others and lead progress. Through our conversations, we are demystifying grooming, taking power away from perpetrators, giving it back to survivors and moving steadily towards a future free from child sexual abuse. As uncomfortable as it all is to talk and hear about, nothing is more uncomfortable than the abuse itself. We'd all do well to remember that. Especially if you suspect abuse, but are anxious about calling it out and being wrong. Embarrassment is a small price to pay compared to the toll of lifelong trauma. And it is a great privilege to not be able to relate to trauma. Despite what abusers would have us believe, we do have agency as a community to decide our values and priorities, to teach each other, to listen and learn. We are not alone. They say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it also takes a village to protect a perpetrator. Collectively, we could end abuse and grooming within a generation if we all committed to doing our part. Simply by engaging in this talk, we're getting closer. Our truth.
is our power. Thank you.